Good morning. The word is glory. Or if you're from the deep south, glory. Glory. The word glory appears some 220 times in the Greek New Testament. But here's the weird part. It has about 47 different definitions. So I ask you in your own mind, what does the word glory mean? To give glory, to ascribe glory, to exhibit glory. Well, today, we're going to define glory as giving honor and praise to someone who deserves it above all. Christ, our King, is not just the King. He is the King, finish it, of kings. He's not just the Lord. He's the Lord of? Exactly. And with that backdrop, we glorify and we sing and we praise and we exalt one who is worthy of glory. He is God, we are not. He is Lord, we are not. He is King, we are not. He is ruler, we are not. He is, we aren't. And with that backdrop, we celebrate and worship the glory of God. Let us stand and sing together. Glory 
Christ our hope in life and death. Can I ask you, is he your hope in life? And is he your hope in death? He is Christ, and because of that promise, we have a most blessed assurance.
ever tell yourself, I don't know how to witness or to evangelize to the lost? Just start with the words of this song, and you will say that this is my story, and this is my song. Please be seated. Take a look at the screen. Turn my back on the past Leave my old ways behind Jesus, I will follow you For you died in my place And you rose from
it is such a joy to plan and lead worship every Sunday. But my heart explodes each time I get to program baptism. The words of that song were so meaningful. And it's always such an exciting time to baptize a new believer, a brother and sister in Christ. But when it's your son, a son who is now my brother, this room can't hold my heart. I've never seen a young man or an old man or a young woman or an old woman more excited about being dunked in these waters. I'm surprised he didn't cannonball in with his excitement. And I want him to tell you, because he's much more articulate than I am, is why you want to be baptized today. Um, I want to be baptized today because um, I want to show the world that I'm a believer and that, um, and that for other people that don't know about this yet, um, I want the world to know that Jesus is real. Normally, we wouldn't pick somebody up in the baptistry waters, but we don't have a stool, so we're making do. Now, you understand that you have asked Christ in your heart and that he is your Lord and Savior, and you want to be obedient through baptism. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I want you to look out here at all these faces that know you and love you since the day you were born in this church. And I'm going to ask them a question. Do you covenant, church family, to continue to pray, to lead, to direct and be a part of this young man's Christian walk as long as he is here. So now, my son, but my brother, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Buried with Christ through baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. <laughs> Amen, church. How cool is that? You get to watch somebody grow up, profess Christ, follow in believers' baptism, and celebrate a life that wants to be obedient to Jesus. How cool is that? The primary discipler, meaning the one who is teaching Christ to somebody else, they're the ones that Scripture gives the joy of baptizing a believer to. Because this is Jesus' command, right? Go into all of the world and teach them and then baptize them. What a cool thing for a daddy to be able to do to his child. But it's not just a daddy to a kid. It could be a friend to a friend, a co-worker to a co-worker. It could be a pastor, a youth pastor, but it doesn't have to be us. Anybody who teaches Jesus to someone else, being obedient to what God wants for you to do, and them wanting to be baptized in like fashion, being obedient to let the world know that they believe in Jesus, you get to be the one to baptize them and celebrate in that connection and in that joy. And I'm convinced if more people taught others about Jesus and then got to stand up there and baptize them, we would be absolutely full. Because that's a joy that you can't possibly understand or purchase with money. You just got to do it and experience it. So if you're teaching somebody about Jesus and they've said, yes, you need to go baptize them, and I will clean, change, fill up, and heat that thing every week if I have to, because that's the goal, right? To do it every single week. If you're not spreading the gospel, please say something to somebody about Jesus because it gives absolute glory to God when we celebrate his goodness. Kids, you guys are dismissed to Children's Church. You get to go play with these two today, so it should be extra fun because you don't have anybody over the age of 18, 17 actually. Oh yeah, it's going to be a blast. Complete chaos. Have fun.
I'm just kidding. Psalm 67, 5 says this, Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Psalm 66, 8 says, Bless our God, O peoples, and sound his praise abroad. All scripture gives glory to God, for his is the kingdom. His is the power. His is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's a question. How are some ways that humans take glory from God? Some of it is so small. Some of it is so unknowing. Some of it is just commonplace culture. I'm going to read some of this out to you this morning so that you understand what I mean. Something simple like saying the phrase to another human being, oh, we could not have done this without you. Really? You couldn't? Any person couldn't fill in that spot if that's what God wanted to do to use them? Maybe. I love you so much, you're my entire world. Sounds nice. Not exactly spiritually nice, though. What about... My wife comes first. Or my family or my children come first. It sounds so endearing and so sweet and so nice. But should they? Should it not be Jesus first? In all things? Obviously he expects you to, especially for a husband, to love your wife as he loves the church. That part is not what I'm speaking about. I'm talking about whatever we place First in life, whatever has capital, whatever has our attention, whatever drives our motives and actions and choices, that could be stealing glory from God. Here's some common achievements that are very cultural for us educational degrees, badges, patches, medals, ribbons, trophies, championships, all the way up to statues of other human beings, all commonplace. But it derails where the glory is supposed to be placed. So much so that when God is telling his people in the beginning of their relationship as he declares Israel his nation and his children and that he is their God, every time they set up a monument to him, do you know what he uses? Nothing made by human hands, but the very rocks that he spoke into being, into creation, that they might pile those up in a location just for the remembrance of his plan his provision, his goodness, and his glory, and his power, and his grace. Nothing created. Instead, what he has made, not what they have made. We're going to be going through Psalm chapter 96 this morning as a reminder to give glory to God alone. This used to be phrased out in Latin, soli deo gloria, meaning glory to God alone. No glory to pastors, no glory to parents, no glory to game winners, trendsetters, influencers, campaign generals, or humanitarians, simply a thank you to God for allowing us to serve in Jesus' name. That should be the absolute end of every Christian life, a glory to God in the highest because he has allowed us to serve him while wearing the name of Christ. Uh, There could be absolutely no greater blessing in the world. And it's something that you can't even earn. There's no education. There's no mindset. There's no background. There's no genealogy. You can't earn wearing the name of Christ. You can just surrender to it. Let's pray, and we're going to go through Psalm 96. Father, thank you so much that we get to celebrate a life submitted to you in faith and in love. That we got to watch a baptism this morning. That that's exactly what it means. That we should get to perform a burial and a resurrection. A physical reminder of what you've done for us spiritually. Father, we give you all the praise and honor and glory for that. It's because of your Christ. It's because of your love and mercy. And it is because of your spirit. 
that we have faith to return praise and worship and obedience to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you got a Bible with you, turn to chapter 96 in the book of Psalms. If you don't, you can scroll on your phone or you can just listen to me and hope I am reading the right words to you. I'm going to read the first verse. I'm going to stop. And we're going to try to attach some things to each verse that we read throughout Scripture so that you can understand the absolute glory of God's goodness through everything that he has done in humanity and what he's written to us in his word. The first verse of Psalm chapter 96 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Luke chapter 19, verse 40, I've put up here. The idea is after being rebuked, Jesus on earth rebuked by humans, says that he is God on earth, and that if human beings weren't declaring his praises, weren't calling him the Christ, weren't expecting the kingdom of heaven, that even the rocks, because of how he created them, would be crying out the absolute power and glory of the one true living king. Jesus replied, I tell you, if these stop speaking, the stones will cry out. And what was happening? He's coming down from the Mount of Olives. He's being praised as the Messiah, God on earth, the one who has come to take away the sins of the world. God in flesh, seen and praised by humans. And the religious leaders were telling him, do you not hear what your disciples are saying? And he says, oh, you don't understand. I don't need people to praise me. I am God. I want them to because it's for their good. Does that make sense to you? It's the literal expression of what he's saying with what he's created. The stones will cry out. I don't need them to. What they're saying is good. Everything you can interact with is already praising me. They're just joining in the symphony that I put in place before any of them were ever alive. They're joining in what creation knows to be absolutely true. Here's another one that I want you to see from Isaiah 55, verse 12. For you will go out with joy and be led in peace. For the mountains and the hills will break into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Again, God does not need our praise to be God. We don't empower God. We can join in the glory that is already His. When we give God the glory... We're not taking glory from us and adding it to his pile. We're acknowledging the fact that we have none of our own and we're returning to him what he has given to us in creation. We're returning to him the acknowledgement in our mind and in our spirit that he is God and that we are not. It's not ours in the first place. Uh, It's such an odd phrase to think, give God glory, as though he didn't already own all of it. He's simply asking us to come into agreement with him according to his design and his word, that he is glory because he's holy and he's good and he's perfect because he is God. I want to read another psalm to you this morning. I don't want to read the whole thing, and I just want you to listen to it. Psalm 148 says, praise the Lord. Uh, Chip talks about it all the time. Phrases that are repeated over and over again. And all of these verses start with the same for the first four. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He's made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all depths. That's an awesome phrase, by the way. Hey, if you don't think they're sea monsters, go ahead and float in the ocean for a while. 
Like, no, thank you. Praise him, sea monsters and all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. It's an interesting thing he says about the weather. It fulfills his word. There's no weather that he does not command. You're not experiencing some sort of natural disaster or phenomenon. You're experiencing the very will of God according to his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl. Listen, I had a creeping thing trying to praise God in my ear last night while sitting on the couch. My ear was tickling me, and I'm like, oh, what is that? And there were legs. There was a spider in my ear. I was going to have a meltdown, but I handled it like a big boy. I mean, I, that's a praise. I don't do spiders. That's an absolute praise. Freaks me out. Sorry, that's not in this verse. Let me focus. Let me focus. Verse 11. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. That's important. If you did not know that today, there is only one name given under heaven on earth by which men must be saved. It is Jesus, the Christ, the one who has come to take away the sins of the world. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He speaks both into creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He speaks these things. His glory is not the glory of heaven. It is above it, far beyond the glory of heaven that is revealed to us. Heaven does not contain God's glory. God's glory spoke it into being. The same with the earth and the fill of the earth. Verse 14 says, And he has lifted up a horn for his people. Praise for all his godly ones, even for the sons of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Oh man, I could read that over and over again. But that's not the only section of scripture that talks about giving glory to God. It's not the only piece of scripture that talks about God's goodness and people celebrating his goodness. All of human history is celebrating his goodness and will do it for eternity. Here's an interesting place to find celebration of God's goodness. Job chapter 38 verse 7 records the dawn of creation and all of the bright morning stars singing the goodness of God. Exodus chapter 15 verses 1 through 19 records the children of Israel giving glory to God because of his deliverance of them through the Red Sea and away from Egypt, their captors. Acts chapter 16, verse 25, another weird place, to sing hymns of praise as both Paul and Silas are in prison, and they're declaring the goodness of the God that they are worshiping while being persecuted for worshiping the goodness of that God. Let me bring you back to Psalm chapter 96. Verses 1 and 2. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. If you're wondering, this is not just some old book of religious things written by people who died 3,000 years ago. This is alive. It is the living word of God. Jesus written out for you to interact with, to learn, to know, to celebrate who God is. And because of that, the psalmist would write, sing to the Lord a new song. Not an old song, not just somebody else's praise or testimony about their life. A praise to God about your life. Something that's happening now. Not something that just happened then. We get a history of the world and humanity as God relates to us, which is beautiful and brilliant for us to know. But you're told to sing a new song. 
You have a testimony now. You have the goodness and grace and mercy of God now. You can celebrate his glory now for what he is doing in and around or through you. Sing to the Lord a new song. All the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Bless the name of Jesus that is given to you and proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Why? Because every single day is the day of salvation until the Lord returns and he is coming. Today is the day of salvation. You can sing the praises of God today with a new song about what he's doing in your life now because every day is the day of salvation. Every single one. And some of you need to hear that this morning. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day you sing a new song of praise to Jesus. Not just because you or someone else or this place had its glory day. We never had a glory day. It's always Jesus's. We don't have a glorious past about, oh, I wish we could go back there. Stop living there. You're alive today. Enjoy the goodness of God today. Celebrate what he's doing in somebody's life today. Instead of just reliving the goodness of the past. It was one of Israel's greatest downfalls. They couldn't let go of the past long enough to see what he was doing with them now. And they missed him. They were relating to what they knew before, not expecting God to do a new work now. The God that we worship and celebrate does not change, but the way he works in our lives changes from minute to minute. So sing to God, give him glory, celebrate a happy heart. You know what makes Aaron happy? I'll throw myself in the boat too. Oh yeah, she got the question eyeballs. Ooh, what are you going to say? <laughs> Good food. If she's sitting at the table, she's going to give God some glory for some food she likes because she'll start, <laughs> she'll start humming and eating and wiggling in her chair because it is good. She has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Anybody else do that? Oh, yeah, I do. I, I didn't even know I did it. I watched her do it one day, and she's like, you do it too. I'm like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know I did that too. Let me read this to you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You want to see a cool connection? Let's see the two of these together. They are both 316s in the Bible. One's Colossians and the other one is John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There are so many cool things that match up in Scripture to his absolute glory. Verse number 3 in Psalm 96 says, Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all people. If God has saved you, you have a story to tell. You know the other way people typically steal glory from God? They shut their mouths. They stop talking about them. Somehow the Christian life becomes a mundane expectation that Jesus has you and he's going to take care of everything and you forget to celebrate when he actually does it, which is every single day. We stop giving our testimony or maybe we don't like giving our testimony because it means we have to admit to other people that at one point I wasn't put together and I'm not perfect and I'm not good and I need something other than me to survive on an average day so we don't tell our testimony because it doesn't give glory to us. Instead, it gives glory to him, so we clam up and we stop talking about the point when Jesus saved us from our sins. And because we've stopped talking about that, we stop recognizing when he does things in our life every single day. And that new song that you're supposed to be singing in praise and worship of glory to God on a daily basis dies with your testimony. And we never speak it. And the rest of the world wonders, well, why in the world do they keep going to that? Well, because that's what good Christians are supposed to do, right? 
Oh, you're supposed to worship and celebrate and dance wildly in an uncontrollable, uncontainable, containable, is that a word? Containable? No, that's not a word. I'm not even going to say the right word. Doesn't matter. You know what I mean. You should be so overjoyed with the relationship that you have with Jesus that you cannot help but speak or say the things. Could you imagine Exodus chapter 14, verse 20? If you don't know what it says, there's a pillar of cloud as they're being chased to a sea just to die because Egyptians are coming to kill them. There's a pillar of cloud that moves from the front leading them. Picture a massive tornado in the sky goes around to the back of all the people running away from the bad guys and it confuses one side. One half of that tornado is absolute darkness to where they have no idea where they're going. Yet God lights the other side of the tornado with fire to show light to the Israelites so they could go the way God is pointing them. One incident with two completely different outcomes for people. Could you imagine seeing and watching this? Of course they had a story to tell. And for some odd reason, we think, because we're not watching a fiery tornado from heaven, that God didn't save you from an absolute torrent of darkness in your life, lighting the path towards Jesus. And we don't say anything. I'm convinced there are people in our average setting here, church Sunday morning, that their life is an absolute tornado. It's pure dark. But Jesus is not. It doesn't have to stay that way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the light of men. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light to our path. Jesus is worthy of being celebrated and honored and glorified because he is God. And so I'm going to give the opportunity. If you know you need Jesus this morning, all you got to do is stand up and start walking this way. Let's talk about it now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can sing a new song. Today is the day that you can step out of the absolute mess of life and celebrate the glory of God. Anybody need that? Just pop up and walk this way if you do. If Jesus is not currently your Savior, but you know you need him because you sinned and you believe that he has paid for your sin and God raised him from the dead so you, you can have new life, so you can belong to him, so you can know your sins are forgiven, so you can be in heaven with him after this life. If you need that, just walk this way. You don't even have to come up here. I'll come down there. Anybody at all? I'm not in any rush. I'll move on. That invitation doesn't stop. You can come to Christ anytime. You don't even have to come up here. You can talk to him where you are, but there's an awful lot of submission and joy in speaking about Christ publicly with others. There's a little bit of a warning, too. He said, if you're ashamed to speak about me in front of men, I am going to be ashamed to speak about you in front of my father. So if you need Jesus, you just pop up at any time. I'll stop what I'm doing, and we'll get right to it. Let me read another piece from Psalm 96 about giving God all the glory, which I absolutely love. I'm going to read the rest of this down, but then I'm going to stop in verse 7 for just a second. Verse 3 and down says, Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples, For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Like, wait a minute, there's more than one God? Oh, yeah, there's a ton of gods, but none of them are real. Just one is, and he's going to say exactly that. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. You get what that means, right? They're fake, they're not real, they're not alive. They're carved images from somebody else's imagination or declaration, and they do absolutely nothing for people except lead them straight to hell. And God says, nope, 
I am the only one who is to be praised among all the gods that people suggest, and there are thousands of them that you could align yourself with if you want to. You know the unfortunate truth? Before Jesus, before putting your faith and trust in Jesus, you are already aligned with all the false gods on the earth. That's a hard truth. Fortunately, because of the goodness of God and his grace and mercy, he sent Jesus, taught us the truth, gave us his word so that we can be aligned with him, the one true living God. If not, those who believe are saved and those who don't are condemned already. Teaching scripture to other people is trying to teach them the truth that they are condemned already. And Jesus has paid the price for that condemning so that they can be set free and aligned with him. Speaking of aligning things with him, I want to read to you verse 7 and 8. It uses the word ascribe. That means to cause or state that somebody is the cause of something. Meaning it's your fault, God, is what it's saying in the psalm. Psalm 96, verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. What's saying there is the only reason there are people on the planet is because God created them. Ascribe to the Lord the responsibility for life. It's not some sort of other scientific explanation. It's certainly not uh, macro evolution. It is Jesus spoke, or God spoke, and it happened. He created, he breathes in life, there are human beings, and only God gives life. So ascribe to the Lord this is your doing, God, all families of all people. We acknowledge you're the one that has created everyone. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. We understand glory and strength belongs to you. It is just God's. It is not ours. Anything that we get to demonstrate that might give somebody glory or uh, that they might say, oh, they're so strong in this or strong in that, it is just from God. It is all his. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. You know what happens in church? We take the glory of God's name and we apply it directly to us as though it's our fault, that we are somehow glorious. You know how I know? Because people who have been Christians for 30 years treat brand new ones or ones who are not Christians much differently, like they're somehow still filthy sinners beneath them. They forget. You used to be the one sheep. All fall short of the glory of God because all sin. This is really important for a church to grow and for you to be able to give your testimony and to actually give glory to God. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. If you call yourself a Christian, you are not by default better than any other person on the planet, no matter how long you've been a Christian or how close you think you are following Jesus. You used to be the sheep. And it's because of his grace and mercy that you are now not. It is the only reason. So make sure when you take on the name of Christ and call yourself a Christian that you're not giving yourself any credit for the good things that you do. Instead, he says, bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established and will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then the trees of the forest will sing with joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he's coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. We're going to close there. Father, thank you for this morning. We give you all the glory because it is not ours to have, to hold, or to keep. 
we are all astray. We are all sinners. We all fall under your grace. And we have no righteousness if it weren't for you saying we are the righteousness of Christ. And so we praise you in his name for the gift of life that you have given us by paying for our sins, something we could not do on our own. We recognize that all people you have given life to and created. We recognize that everything we could possibly interact with, you have given. We recognize that you give us air, you control it and could take it from us. You created our lungs. We're giving back to you what you already own. It's not ours, we're just borrowing it because of your goodness. We can't even control our next breath. And Father, we are so grateful that in Christ all things hold together and we know who does control it. Help us deliver that message to the ends of the earth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to make a little audible here. It's hard as a worship leader when you see a title screen or a title slide on the screen that says glory to God. And that wasn't the song you had planned to end with. It's a song we started with. But with the lens of what we've heard this morning, we will sing glory to God forever one more time. And I hope that it is a new song here some 40 minutes later. Will you stand and let's sing as we celebrate that promise. Before the world was made Before the world was made Before you spoke it to me You were the king of kings Yeah, you were and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. The next verse says, Creator God, you gave. You gave me breath so I can praise. Let's sing that. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise. Your great and a matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering. A life that sounds and sings the greatness of my King. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. to sing to the Lord a new song. Be safe, be well, be blessed, and be back next week to sing his praise and to tell our story.